thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Ella, I'm a designer based in New York City. So you probably saw that I'm gonna be doing a natural dyeing demo, but before that, I'm gonna talk a bit about my design process and how we got there and how I started experimenting with food to use to color fabric. So the first project that I did, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see. So this collection was called Two and Seven and the whole idea started because when I graduated from school and came to New York and was trying to find a job, someone told me my work was garbage. And in response, I decided to create a collection out of garbage to basically say, yes, okay, it's garbage, but how can we make garbage beautiful and to challenge that idea? So the first thing I did was really think about sustainability because everyone does it, but no one really understands what that means. So I wanted to work entirely with garbage. And I traveled around New York City, New Jersey, and all around the tri-state area, contacting vendors, businesses, schools, and really looking at their waste and just asking them if I can see it, all the fabrics that were gonna be thrown away. And I was shocked. Before I started this project, I had really honestly no interest in sustainability. It wasn't my thing. And then I saw how much fabric was being thrown away, how many garments were being thrown away, how much waste there was. Literally, I was standing in mountains of fabric. And the first place I went, I remember I took 30 yards of fabric home that they were just going to throw in a landfill. So what I decided to do was to take all the fabrics and create a collection. So the collection you see here is what happened after. So I made these pieces and I wanted to really focus on the manipulation. And I was like, okay, if I'm making stuff out of garbage, I also need to manipulate the fabric the same way. So how can I change it? Dyeing it, right? You can dye it to change the color and to build textures and everything but it had to be with garbage. So I started contacting restaurants, edible arrangements, anywhere that sold food, fruits, vegetables, anything. And I collected them and put them in compost bins. And what you're seeing here are garments that I pulled out of a compost bin. Each bin had a specific color so I could see if I could manipulate the color. So for example, these pants, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the pants were all pineapple. The top was all spinach and anything that was kind of green. And there's dirt in there because there was dirt in the bits. Here you have beets, you know, and then there was some yellow because it was citrus mixed in. I had so much citrus that I just mixed citrus with everything. And this was all experimentation. I didn't know anything about natural dyeing. I didn't know anything about sustainability. I didn't know anything about anything. I just wanted to prove that garbage wasn't garbage. And I wanted to show that to people. And I have some details of all the garments. You'll see some of the shapes, like this looks like, it's covered in dirt, but it's a basic sweater shape. And I wanted to do that because I think it's easier for us to understand things when they're in familiar shapes. So because this looks like a shirt, you, your brain sees it as a shirt, but then you think of it in a different way. You see it, it's covered in all this dirt, it's covered in everything, and it causes the viewer to think like, why? It's still a shirt. The same thing here with these pants and this top. I really wish, let's see, so then, I took that collection, I think this is the part two. I presented it on a runway to show that it could be a fashion collection and kind of convince people, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. To put it in a different setting. Yes, it's garbage, but it's on a runway, right? And there's a body and someone's wearing it and it's moving and it's still made out of garbage, but it has the music, there's the people, there's the background, right? It's a runway. 
So I really wanted to challenge that and challenge the audience. And I think as designers, we have a lot of power with what we do to really, what we make can make people think. And I think that's the most important thing about design. So when I create something, it's not just about this product. It's about the thought process behind it, the materials, and everything is a part of everything. The other thing I did, so we have the girls, you know, it's a runway show. I wanted to keep presenting this collection in multiple ways. So the other thing I did was I made a film to explain this process, but in an artful way, again, artful, but different. And this film I shot in London, I picked models that didn't identify with a particular gender because I wanted to speak about how beauty is genderless. And um, we shot this in an ice well, kind of like, you know, the bottom of the earth, the things that you're finding at the bottom of the earth. And you have the trash on the floor, but it's in this beautiful place. So I took the same idea, but put it in a different setting for a different audience to communicate something different. It's still art, but it's fashion, but it's made out of trash and challenge that idea. And I have the fruits and everything here. So you can kind of get an idea how things were made, the environment that they live in. I think the best part of this though, is the table where you'll see a little bit of what we're doing today with the jars, with the color. And these are the garments, the same garments that were on the runway, they're now in the film. So I've since taken this process, obviously this isn't for everyone, right? I've taken this process and I've adapted it. So as a designer, I exclusively work with reused materials. I don't buy anything. Everything is naturally dyed with something that I create or find or foods, usually in my fridge. And this, is, this collection is the same. It's a process, but it's adapted now. So instead of using dirt, I'm doing stovetop dyeing, which is what I'm gonna be showing you guys. And these fabrics, I'm experimenting more with what colors I can get and how to take this process but refine it. And the skins in this collection were actually, I found from an artist who, she collects, web, like, um, how do I explain this? She collects parts of animals from factories that can't be sold, like consumed by humans. So like, for example, this is stomach lining. Another piece is part of a throat. So taking these things, taking things that people don't necessarily think are beautiful and making them beautiful is my ethos as a designer. And I'm gonna stop the share. I wish I had. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna show you guys how to do these things at home with things that you probably have laying around in your house. And if you don't, I'm sure, just experiment. And we're gonna figure out, you can, anything can become anything. So, welcome to my little dyeing station. So the first thing you're gonna do have these jars for you so you can see the color. Normally I would just do this on a stove top, but you can just do it in a container or in a bowl. If you want to dye things for a longer period of time, you can do it on the stove. The best fabrics for this are cotton, anything natural fiber, linen, silks. 
And what you want to do before you start dyeing or anything is you want to pre-soak your fabric. So you want to wash everything, make sure it's clean. I like to pre-soak in vinegar. So you want to do a one to four ratio. So if you have four cups of water, you want to do one cup of vinegar. You can also add salt if you're using things with plants, like today we'll be using onion peels. So salt will help stick, get the dye to stick to the fabric, which is what you want. I don't use mordants. Mordants are chemicals that you can use to help really help the dye stick to the fabric, but mordants are toxic. So I don't like to use them, but you can. Oh, you have turmeric, I see it. I see it, we're gonna do that today too. That's the best one. So I have my water going. I wouldn't recommend, I'm gonna be pouring the water from a pot. I would recommend a teapot. So the first thing I have is a beet. This is a tiny sad remain of a beet because I've been dying things all week, but what you're gonna do is we're gonna cut off the skin from the beet, right? And you can see the pigment is already coming off like in my hands because there's so much pigment in that. And you wanna cut everything off. If you cut the beet into smaller pieces, it helps to release the dye because this kind of works like a tea. So once you cut it, put it in the bottom of your vessel, right? So it's gonna live there. You take the water, my water has salt in it because this is a plant product and you're just gonna pour the water right in there and you can kind of see it's already happening. The dye is coming And it works like a tea. It's gonna stew. You should be using a spoon. Do not use a knife. That is the wrong thing to do. You can see it's already happening. Like it's becoming pink. The longer you leave whatever you're dyeing in the vessel, the more potent it will become. Some things that you use won't have as much pigment but beets have a particularly strong pigment. So I'm literally just gonna cut a little piece. I'm gonna pop it in there. We're gonna check on it later and I'm gonna pop the cotton in there and you can see different fabrics take different, they take the pigment differently just because of the composition and you will figure that out as you experiment. And I'm just gonna leave that there. We're gonna go back to them later. I saw Sylvie had turmeric. So we'll do that one next. Turmeric is also amazing and it doesn't come out of anything. So you can wash turmeric. You can, I mean, I've tried to bleach it out of things. It doesn't work. Turmeric will stay forever. So if you really want something yellow, I would highly recommend using turmeric and you really don't need that much. I'm not gonna put that much in here. That's probably like less than a teaspoon. And I'm gonna pop it in there. And it will like instantly become bright, 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 bright yellow. And it's like tea. So if you've ever made tea or done like antique dyeing with tea paper, it's the same process. So we have that there and I'm gonna put, you'll see like the second the fabric goes in there, that's one, pop that in there. It becomes so yellow. Not everything is gonna be as, the, as vibrant as the turmeric. Some things really need the mordant, but if you wanna use mordant, you can get it, you can get it from any craft store really. You can get it on Amazon, unfortunately. If you wanna buy things from Amazon, you can get it pretty much anywhere, aluminum, copper, tin, like they're very toxic things. So you can use them. I wouldn't recommend whatever pot you use to dye with a mordant, do not eat with it. Please, I beg you, do not eat with it ever. Get a separate pot. And I'm just gonna show you how like powerful this is because this guaranteed is 
already yellow. Like it's already yellow. I don't know if you can see that, but it's already bright yellow. My personal favorite to dye things with are onion peels. This one takes a little longer and I would recommend if you really want to try it, let it simmer on a stove. But we're going to do the same thing and we're going to pop them in there. So this is a yellow onion. Let's see. And so Ellie, you're using the same salted water for... I'm using the same salted water for everything, yeah. If you want a non, oh, I see a question. If you want a non-Amazon source, a lot of craft stores will have them. Sculpting stores will have them. Um, some yarn stores will have mordants because you dye yarn with, if you naturally dye yarn, you're definitely gonna need a mordant. Um, Honestly, I Googled the other day and I was going to buy it myself. I was going to buy tin because I need to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be dying different things. Like if you want something to be more green, you want to use a copper, um, what was it? I was going to buy tin because tin is like more fuchsia red tones. Mm. So it's really all experimenting. Yep. There we go. <laughs> Do I'm a treating tray. This is gonna take a while. So I actually have, I'm gonna put the fabric in there, but I did one in advance so you guys can see what it will look like. So this is a yellow onion I did yesterday and you can see the pigment is much darker now. But yellow onion, it doesn't have, I like to use it for my work because I like a softer, I don't know if you guys can see that, if that helps at all. I like a softer tone, something that kind of just looks tea dyed. And you'll see on the different fabrics, like on the cotton, it took a little darker. And then Ella, I just had one question. Oh, there's yeah. actually a question from Mario and said, um, can you use roses slash flowers? And have you done so before for dyeing? You can use flowers. Roses are good. Um, the thing with roses is you really need, you kind of have to, you need like a red rose. You need a really pigmented flower. So if you want to use flowers, like I wouldn't recommend obviously anything white, anything with a pale, it's not going to work. You need something really pigmented, like a rose could work. Um, even like a deeper color tulip, things like that, but you need a lot of them. Like one rose isn't gonna do it. And you might have to actually like crush the rose to get the pigment out. If you just stick the petals in, it's not gonna happen, but you would need to like press it and get the actual pigment out of it. It doesn't really work like a tea. It'll be very light. Um, lavender works really well for like a purpley kind of gray color. And anything yellow, yellow pigments are always really strong. Yellows will work. What else do we have here? So, oh, for like berries, also great. So if you have frozen berries, I like about the frozen berries, like regular non-frozen berries will work, but when the berries defrost, they'll release the pigment because they've already kind of shrunk, they kind of dried out, right? So when you pop them in there, and yes, we're in my kitchen because this is where I make clothes. As they start to defrost, the pigment will come out. You see the pink comes out. The thing about if you use like actual food, like berries, like onion peels, it's the scrap of something, right? 
berries, I wouldn't recommend if you're going to leave something for a long period of time, I wouldn't recommend leaving them in there for a few days. I would recommend really boiling them and kind of rinsing it, smashing up the berries and really turning it into a tea because the berries will mold within a few days. So if you come the next day, oh, did you do it? I see someone did it. <laughs> that looks so great. But I forgot what I was saying. If you use the berries, yeah, you want to either keep it on the stove and then strain the berries out. I wouldn't leave it overnight. You can leave it overnight with the liquid, but don't leave it overnight with just the berries and the water in there. Let's see. I'm pop and then I had a question about mixing pigments. Uh, would you yeah. recommend mixing or would you? Yes think it's better to have like a pigment up closer to the color that you had in mind. No, it works just like paint. So okay. you can mix pigments. It's hard to find the balance. So as you're kind of, when you're in the pot, I think the best, so turmeric kind of overpowers everything, right? So turmeric is a little tricky. So when you do something with turmeric, you would put a little bit in there and then this is the beat, right? you'll get kind of an orange. It works just like paint. It works just like the color wheel. The thing is you have to be, turmeric is tricky because it's so strong, it will turn everything yellow. So this will still be orange, but it'll be a very yellow orange. But if you mix, like let's say the onion peel, you know, is too orange, right? You can take, I have, that's a beet pigment. I don't know if you guys can see it. That's a beet peg pigment that's been sitting for about a day and it's really, really, really purple. If I take that, then it becomes a different color. So it does work. You just have to be careful with what you're using and how much you're using. But I mean, that's the fun of creating anything, right? You just kind of keep going. My favorites are really the onions. The red onion is amazing. So I'm going to actually show you. I've done this yesterday. And, I'm and then show we you. also got a quick question from Jasmine yeah. asking Do yeah. textual changes ever occur in the fabric after dyeing with different yes, types of natural do. surfaces? They do. So silks will become, silks become rougher. You can add, um, if you're doing something with a wool or something with like a wool or a linen, like baking soda, believe it or not, or salt, do we need to rinse? Yes, you do need to rinse after dyeing. Um, baking soda, or there's something called soda ash. If you add soda ash, which baking soda works pretty well if you don't want to buy soda ash. You add like two to three tablespoons for four cups before you start dyeing when you pre-soak the fabric. That really helps with the texture, but if you just stick it in there, yes, the fabric without any sort of protective will, it'll start to change the texture. And we have another question from Mario asking, what would you recommend for a black color? Okay, so black is literally the hardest to achieve color. I think even with, if you're using a writ dye, it's almost non-achievable. But what I would recommend is, believe it or not, charcoal. And charcoal, and then you have to use a, um, you have to use a mordant. You really have to use a mordant if you want like pure, 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 pure black. Like ash is the only thing I've seen people use to achieve getting an actual black color. I've tried black. I've tried black with black bean and then like mixing ash together. And it still comes out kind of purple. But I think that's because I'm not using a mordant at all. Uh, what else do we have here? Does anyone else have any other questions about colors? Oh my gosh, what are you making? I'm so excited for you. <laughs> you 
You guys can unmute if you want to talk, so you can unmute your mic. If yeah, you want. feel free. <laughs> she, she's an aspiring fashion designer, and oh my gosh, die in the house. So I thought this was perfect. <laughs> And also, I'm making costumes for a play that I'm going to be in with my friends because we're going to be doing it for one of their birthday parties. That's amazing. <laughs> we can mute ourselves again, right? What else? I have black things on there. We can do another fun thing. Probably my favorite is black beans. So for black beans, you need to use the dried, just a bag of black beans. Black beans will take longer because this needs to sit overnight. I'm going to show you the difference. So you're not going to see it happen right away with the other one. But you'll see like right now that just looks like beans in a cup, right? There's nothing going on. Black beans, like, you know, before you cook them, they need to soften up. For that, when you soak them, within a few hours, they'll get softer, but they also release a pigment. So this is about, I would say, four hours of black beans sitting, and you'll see it's completely purple now, as opposed to before. The water does need to be hot. And it releases this really pretty purpley kind of color. Yeah. We have it there. And it's lighter, obviously, on the cotton, it's lighter because the fabric isn't op as opaque. You do need to rinse once you finish dyeing everything. You rinse and you dry it. It might, it most likely will come out lighter than what you've seen here. So you'll see like these have all been rinsed. The black beans that I have on my hand, like this is much darker than what you see on the, you know, swatch chart. But you can always re-dye them if you want a different pigment or if it's another way to mix. So if you want something to appear more pink, you can dye like black beans with, you know, as is, and then you could dye it again with beets and it'll become more pink and you can change the colors that way. And is there any like preferred aftercare for the fabric? So if you're, you know, gonna wear the garment a lot. Is there anything like you prefer as far as like washing it detergent wise or is like easy care okay? I wouldn't. So I would hand wash it because the first couple, you're going to wash it the first time, right? You're going to hand wash it. The first thing I would do is wash it with vinegar because some of these things do smell. Onion smell, spinach smells, you know, any sort of citrus does have a smell. So wash it with vinegar the first time. That'll get all the excess dye out. And then the second times I would hand wash it. You can use a gentle, like a light natural detergent. I have, I think mine is literally called Neat or something. I forget what it's called, but it's just a natural detergent and just hand wash it. And it's, it should, the first couple times dye will come out. I feel like that's with anything, but eventually it'll stick and the pigment that is there will stay. And we have a question from Sylvia asking if canned beets can be used as opposed to... You can definitely use canned beets because all that water is pink. All that water in the can is pink. You can definitely use canned beets for sure. Canned black beans I wouldn't recommend. They're kind of slimy. What was, what was one of the most unusual things that you used to dye? Like maybe something that you wouldn't think about and we're like, oh, that worked out quite well. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, honestly, the first thing that I was really surprised about was onion peels. I was shocked because I really wanted that parchment paper kind of look, but I didn't want to use tea because everyone uses tea. And I always cook with onions. So I was so, I was like, okay, great. I'm going to have so many onion peels. And I froze them and then 
use that. It's honestly my favorite thing to dye with. I'm shocked at the pigment that things like pineapple, pineapple actually has a lot of pigment. If you want yellow and you don't want to use turmeric, but you want a softer yellow, pineapple has a lot of pigment. I was surprised, but it smells terrible. And I'm just going to warn you beforehand, before you try it, that when you cook with it, it does smell really bad. Um, if you want to dye something larger, you're going to need a lot of scraps if you're going to use food. I particularly dye with foods that I have in my apartment or, you know, if I have food waste, I actually keep it in um, a bag in my freezer so that it can stay over time and that keeping it in the freezer kills any bacteria that might be living in there before you put it in on the stove top, which helps with the dyeing so you can use the products for a longer duration or you can keep it, you know, you could keep it in the pot. I find that keeping the product in, if you want to dye something, let's say you want to keep something for like a few days in the pot to really get the pigment in there. I personally do like to leave it on the stove for maybe like an hour on like medium heat, let it simmer and then just let it sit there. And then the next day, I'll take, maybe I'll take it out and dry it and I'll put it in there again and do the process again to build the color. If you freeze things beforehand, it does help. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> And we have a question from Alex, um, and they're asking about using avocado pits slash peels to dye, and if you've done that before. I have tried the pits. I haven't had luck with the pits. The peels come out a really kind of pretty purple color. With avocados, typically you do need, I feel like you need a mordant to really get the color that you want. When I do it without a mordant, I get kind of a golden, golden, almost brown, kind of color, but when you add a mordant, um, a tin or an aluminum mordant, it does give you that like purpley shade. It's the same, you put it, boil it, add your vinegar, add salt to really get the pigment in there. And Jenna sharing that they use avocado <laughs> before, it smells terrible. <laughs> um, a lot so of any smell terrible. <laughs> instead of avocado? A lot of these things do smell pretty, pretty bad, but you know, it's kind of, I feel like the vinegar really does help with that problem. When I first did, started doing this and I was making those clothes, those clothes that I first showed you that I buried in the bins, I ended up putting into stores and the first thing they complained about was the smell that everything just, they were like, this smells, it's beautiful, but it smells like trash. And I was like, that's because it is trash. And then ended up spraying it with vinegar and it was fine. So I think adding the vinegar really helps. You wanna do a one to four ratio. So if you have four cups of water, you wanna add one cup of vinegar or one cup of salt. I like to add more salt. You'll see other people add like two to three tablespoons of salt. I do like to add more. I feel like it does help with the pigment um but definitely vinegar one to four and for baking soda i think two to three teaspoons don't go crazy and mario's asking besides black are there any other colors that might be difficult to get vibrancy is really difficult to get if you don't use the mordant i feel like blue i've had a hard time i really have wanted to get a blue, like a true blue. I think purples are very prevalent in nature, but blue isn't. So when you're dying, when you're dying with natural materials, really think about what's prevalent in nature because those things that you see at the grocery store in my case, or at the flower shop or just, you know, outside, those are the colors that you can achieve through natural dyeing. Like black isn't something, you know, they're not, there's no black like vegetable, right? unless it's rotten. There isn't like blue, a true blue, I've found pretty difficult. I've achieved a teal by mixing, I think if it was, I think it might've been onions and spinach. 
I've gotten a teal, but I've had a hard time getting a true blue. Are you, are you working on any new collections now? Um, with any new I'm, I'm actually working on a project for the Biennale. I hope that it's not going to be canceled. Um, that's ironically about utopia and creating a city that basically if humans, it's about global warming. So like if humans destroy the planet, what would be the ideal city, the perfect city for all of us to live in? And I'm creating characters for that city. And I'm trying to build, I'm still working with the dime, but I'm also trying to build these characters with materials that are already available. Because even if it is utopia, the end of the world has to have happened first. Um, so when I design, I really always think about the purpose and what's the end goal and what's the message that we're trying to, I'm trying to send and what I'm trying to speak on. And I really am focusing on right now, I'm collecting all my materials and that's a little difficult because everything is closed, but really looking into what I have that's around me and what's readily available. And even I've been using food, but now I'm looking at the packaging that food comes in and thinking, oh my God, how can I use that? How can I use the packaging? How can I use the takeout containers? How can I use what my groceries come in to create clothes and manipulate them in different ways? and make people think that that's fabric or that's a garment without it looking, you know, like a plastic bag or without it looking like a Tupperware container. So that's my new development. Hi, Sylvie. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another question from Kelly asking if you have any advice for aspiring designers in terms of finding visions or identity as a designer? I think that's the most important you can do, most important thing you can do as a designer. And I think that'll change throughout your whole life because you're constantly developing and evolving and growing. And my first vision when I started as a designer was it really started with this, someone calling my work garbage and I really wanted to prove them wrong. And that's why I made a collection. And I was so determined the first couple years of my career to prove people wrong. I wanted to be in stores. So I went by myself and got my clothes into stores. I wanted to show, to do a runway show. So I put it on myself and I wanted, you know, to keep, I wanted to do so many things and I achieved all those things and I did that. And I think now my values have shifted and I really want to create things that make people think, but also that are in, inspirational and I want to be able to give back to other designers and that motivates me and I would recommend that you as a designer think about what's important to you the values in your life and the stories in your life attach them to your work there are ways everything is everything and every experience is a learning experience and every thing that happens in your life can influence your work. And I would say, let it, let it influence your work and tell your story because ultimately what we're selling is ourselves. We're selling, that's what makes you you is your vision, your story, where you come from, what's happened to you, what you believe that makes you who you are. And if you can capture that in clothing or capture that in whatever architecture, or whatever you're doing, any kind of design, product design, you've achieved everything, right? Because you've made a product that's completely unique to you or you've made art that's completely unique to you. Now, don't be afraid of where ideas come from. They can come from anywhere. Um, I had a question about dyeing with the coffee. Um, yes. Use the like pre-ground or is it like whole beans and are they stewed before or like what's the process? I use pre-ground. So I use the world's cheapest coffee, which is of course MIA at this time. But I use the pre-ground coffee because I don't have a grinder. 
I find that it gets color a lot faster. And that pigment also, it's a pigment that really sticks. When you use the pre-ground coffee, definitely strain it because otherwise you're gonna get coffee grinds in everything. It'll catch every fiber, every everything that you don't want. That's what will happen. So definitely strain it and think of it, really think of it as like you're making tea. Like if you've ever seen, you know, like if you've ever made tea, like in a tea, even with a tea bag, but like loose tea, that's how I would compare it. If you're making loose tea, you want to put the pigment in there, strain it out, and then put your product in there. For coffee, you don't really need salt. I would recommend the vinegar. It just helps it get more brown. But what's interesting with coffee is when you first put it in there, it'll kind of become a khaki color. And then if you leave it, it'll become more pigmented. But you need a lot of coffee. Have you ever, <laughs> have you ever tried like a secondary, like you make coffee and then you reuse the grounds? I, mean, I imagine it would be much paler, yes. but does it still like have staying power works. as a dye? Yes. Cool. It still works. That's fun. I reuse everything. I even save my tea bags to dye stuff with it later. My freezer is ridiculous. I save everything. I have a lot of coffee grounds. Start <laughs> saving them. <laughs> Start saving them. Start saving them. And I you mean, you might need more. Do a test. Always test first. Um, that's one mistake I made. I don't think it's really a mistake. I think it's fun to experiment, but I'll just throw things in the pot and be like, yes, this is going to be amazing. And then I'll pull it out and be like, oh, this isn't the color I wanted. And then re-dye it again and just keep going on and on and on and on. But um, definitely, I mean, when I dye with coffee, I usually use at least one, at least one cup, but the one cup will give you that khaki color. So I would probably, if it's already, you know, if you've already used it to make a cup, maybe double it. But you can always, you know, you can pull it out, dry it, and then do it again. Yeah. And are, would green leaves, like from, say, like the leaves of a flower um, or the stems, would that give you um, more of a yellow pigment or would you get a green from that? Could it you gives you a yellow. yellow it yeah. gives you like a yellowy, it's still like a yellowy green, but it'll give you like a, it'll give you like a yellow, but also really great to work with. I like with flowers, I particularly like to dry them first. So I'll hang them upside down and dry them out and then crush them up and use them that way as opposed to using the um, fresh flower. I don't know, I find that it makes it easier for you to get the color. And the color just, it comes right away as opposed to, I don't know why when it's fresh, it just takes longer than you want it to. And is there anything that you have used that was would achieve a green color or is it kind of, mixing together like a bluish and a yellow um spinach is pretty green like a limey kind of green it's soft though but spinach is pretty potent I, out of everything i've used i feel like spinach spinach and even like arugula or parsley parsley is more yellow but like spinach is probably the strongest one Well, we have about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has any last minute questions or just like things you're curious about or projects that you wanna share that you're gonna try, um, you know, feel free to do that now. And you can also unmute and just ask a question that way too. And we have one question from Jasmine asking, more generally, how do you navigate the commercial side of design while also trying to be sustainable? A really good question. Um, so I had my brand, my brand was called Dops, and it, I didn't use my name. Um, the acronym was dates of birth and sequence. It was supposed to be a physical timeline of my work and my art. And I, when I first started, 
I just kind of made whatever I wanted. And then I realized, yes, okay, I do need to commercialize this and get it into a store. And the first thing that I did was go shopping. We can't really, you can't really go into stores now, but the first thing I did was visit stores or really look into, look at the stores that I wanted to be in, that I saw my clothes in and look at the other designers who were there and what they were doing and try to figure out the customer. What does my customer need? So I took my ideas and I did simplify them. The important thing for me, I mean, it was just me. So I was making all these clothes in my apartment by myself, sometimes with a sewer, two sewers. So I sourced fabrics locally. I made things, I picked, you know, smaller lots of yardage. I didn't buy, you know, a hundred yards of anything because that's not what I could produce. I think commercial fashion really escalated you don't need to be a Zara. You don't need to be an H&M. It's just not, I mean, nobody needs that much stuff. I think the most important thing is when you figure out who your customer is, you need to figure out what they need. And you take the ideas you have and connect it to what that person needs. So, you know, if that person is in athletic wear every day, take your ideas and apply them to athletic wear. In my mind, my girl, it was more evening. So I made, you know, tool skirts and I made lace tops and I specialized in lace, but I adapted what I love into more accessible things. But it's really commercial. Anything is really about knowing your customer and researching who that person is and thinking about a lifestyle and how you can accommodate that. Any other questions? <laughs> I think that the sustainability aspect of it is so important now, and it's been such like a huge topic, especially with fashion design. And do you feel that that was something that you kind of always thought about even when you were in school and developing your collection, or was it something that you just kind of, it kind of fell into and then it just kind of worked for you? It's something that I fell into because when I went to school, it was different. It was, sustainability wasn't really emphasized. I went to school, we learned how to make something, we learned how to be a designer. We were told to be Ralph Lauren. I was told to be Prabal Gurung. I was told to be Alexander Wang, which are very commercial designers. And no one taught me about sustainability. Nobody taught me about dyeing and chemicals and all these harmful things that the fashion industry are doing. No one ever talked about labor and outsourcing labor and how, you know, we're abusing, you know, resources of other countries. Like nobody explained that. It wasn't until I started doing my own research and going to the mills and seeing everything. I went to a Zara factory one time when I was overseas and I saw the working conditions and I saw those people and I had such a problem with it. I just couldn't stand for it and I couldn't be a part of it and they didn't want anything to do with it. And that's why it became such a stance for me. Even now when I'm working on this new project, I refuse to buy anything. I refuse to buy anything from Amazon. I refuse to buy anything from Walmart. I just, it's not in my ethos. And I know people don't know that. I know the consumer doesn't know that, but I think consumers are changing. And I think we all want to know more about everything now and we're curious, but it's really, for me, it's my integrity as a designer. I just can't sit with myself knowing that something was made unethically and that I made, you know, one top and then threw away all the extra fabric. I just, I can't sit with it. And I feel like industries are changing. There's a lot of things now because of the situation that we're in. They're no longer accessible that were so easy for us to get before. It was so easy for us to rely on China before to get our materials and now it's not. It was so easy for us, you know, just to send something somewhere to get fabric from another country and now, or to get any, you know, any material. And now we can't do that. So I 
hope that it'll change and people start realizing that we do have resources here and think about production differently. But we'll see. I feel like everyone's going to try to continue things the old way before they realize that they do need to change. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very, it's something that's really important to me now. I just, I can't create something. I just can't create something that way. It just doesn't sit right with me at all. Well, I hope more designers become like you and <laughs> just I I hope so too. <laughs> um, well, on that amazing note, um, I think we're going to call it um, a night on our final design talk. Um, thank you so, so much, Ella. This was so fun. And I'm so glad that some of our, our guests were able to actually follow along and dye some fabric with you. So that was great. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'll stay on until about seven if you have any last minute questions. Um, but yeah, we can give maybe Ella a big round of applause. Um, thank you so, so much. Thanks for having me.